record now. And yes, okay, great, we're recording. So I'm Jenny, you all know me. Um, I'm our information literacy coordinator. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna ask y'all to do, and this is just so I can uh, you know, make sure everybody's good on using the chat, is to ask you to put your favorite source for news in the chat. So where do you get most of your news from? And this is a question I usually do ask students when I'm doing a session like this. So just using that Zoom chat, where do you get most of your news? Twitter, a very common uh, response that I get, um, Juanita, from other people, try not to watch the news. It's a, it's a dark time in the news cycle. Got a lot of CNN fans here, very nice, very nice. Local newspaper, Sean, I think that's helpful. CNN, NPR, Washington Post. I learned, um, I did a news uh, fact checking workshop for a media studies class this week and a bunch of students said that they get their news from TikTok now, um, which I'm not super familiar with TikTok, but it's not a place that I would have expected um, people to get news from. I thought it was just like fun videos. Um, Catherine, yes, last week tonight with John Oliver, a great place to get caught up on the news. I actually use a lot of his videos in my instruction, um, but I usually have to find, you know, cleaned up versions. Um, all right, awesome. So just wanted to get us warmed up a little bit. So my goals for us today, um, we're gonna talk about what this SIFT technique is. We're gonna talk about some useful fact-checking resources as well as some fact-checking strategies, not just resources. And then we are gonna have some time to actually use this SIFT approach um, to fact check some different types of sources. We're gonna do one together and then um, we will try to do a couple separately. So here's what SIFT stands for. Um, it stands for stop, investigate the source, find better, he says find, the person who created this, Mike Caulfield says find better coverage. I often think of it more as like find other coverage or find trusted coverage um, because we don't have to start from the assumption that what we're looking at is bad coverage, right? It could be something that's completely accurate and that we feel good about. Um, so we don't just use SIFT when we're worried something's bad. Um, and then the T is trace claims, quotes, and media back to original context. Um, and I do have a short link to um, Mike Caulfield. Um, to his blog post where he sort of, um, I guess, coined this. Um, and one of the things that's, or there are a few things that are important to know about what SIFT isn't. So it's not a checklist. So if you have had experience using um, checklist type approaches to source evaluation, so ABC, ABCD, CRAP, those I think can still be used um, in ways that aren't checklisty. Um, but he actually, Mike Caulfield, proposes SIFT as an alternative to checklist methods because he wants people to focus. And if we look at it, um, if we look at it, it's really about actions. There are verbs there. It's sort of about behaviors and actions that you can take rather than like checklist of things to look for. It's not a rubric in a similar way. It's not a way to predict the future. And I say this because um, uh, when I recently was using this technique with a class that was doing a political ads assignment, they were analyzing political ads, um, and I was using this to, to talk to them about the fact that when we see these really sort of generic 30 second um, political ads, like when I'm in office, I will do X, Y, and Z, um, you know, there's no way to use a technique like SIFT or any other technique to look into the future and see if something will eventually be true. Um, and then finally, it's not a cure for confirmation bias. It doesn't, um, like using a method of like SIFT, even though it's helpful, it's still, it's not going to like cognitively change the way we process information. So it's, it's not like we can say, oh, I used SIFT, so I know for sure that everything that I am looking at in the news is good, right? Because we're still going to, um, in a lot of ways, be drawn to things that do confirm what we already believe and what we already value and what we already think um, is true about the world. So it's not, you know, it's not magic. I'm going to talk for a second here about different fact-checking resources. Newspapers are great fact-checking resources. 
Um, they aren't always going to go through and say fact check yes or no, like we might see some other types of resources do. Um, and then, of course, Google. Google is actually maybe the best fact checking resource that we have out there um, because it can give us access to lots of different information very quickly. I am going to, in the chat, paste a guide that I am working on um, that is focused on SIFT. Um, and I'm going to open it up here so that we can talk about it. Um, so I created this. Um, I initially wanted it to just be a fact checking resources guide, but I didn't feel like that went into enough depth about how to integrate fact checking into the process of actually like evaluating information. Um, so there is a good bit about SIFT on here. So if it's something that you're interested in learning more about, it actually comes from um, an OER, an awesome OER um, called Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers, which is a full fully online book um, in press books written by Mike Caulfield, the one who sort of invented SIFT or coined it. Um, so I have links to that. I have SIFT in the four moves. This, the four moves is just another sort of way he communicates this same idea about behaviors. Um, and then videos um, where he kind of walks through his process, some additional videos about this um, lateral reading technique, which I'll talk more about. Um, but lateral reading is really in this in SIFT. Um, lateral reading is mostly useful for investigating the source. So if we're finding a source of information and we want to learn about that source, we can't really stay inside the source. So if I want to know, um, you know, if I want to know if here's here's an example, the onion, something that we probably all recognize as, uh, you know, not being uh, like as being a satirical news source. Um, if I stick within the onion and I go to, um, let's see, let me find their bad page if I can. I hate when this happens and you just have to keep scrolling. Maybe it's up here somewhere. Um, okay, so if I go to the onions about page, like if I don't ever leave the site itself, um, it tells me here the onion is the world's leading news publication offering highly acclaimed universally revered coverage of breaking national, international and local news. Rising from its humble beginnings as a print newspaper in 1756, The Onion now enjoys a daily readership of 4.3 trillion and has grown into the single most powerful and influential organization in human history. Now, this is obviously, yes, that, yes, Catherine, it is sad. Um, and it also is sad how often um, The Onion gets it a little too right. Like at the beginning, I remember at the beginning of COVID, there was an Onion piece that was like, you know, insurance companies worry that GoFundMe will be overwhelmed as people try to uh, deal with medical costs caused by COVID. And I was like, oh no, that's too real. But if we just focused in, if we only looked at what this site is saying about itself, you know, we might be able to tell that it's pretty exaggerated. But if we took them at their word, obviously this information would be completely inaccurate. But if I go back to my Google search about the onion, um, if I were to just take a quick look at Wikipedia, which is a great lateral reading resource, it tells me it's an American satirical digital media company. Um, so I would be able, by leaving the site itself, um, I would be able to understand the site better, which is one of the ways that SIFT differs from something like um, CRAP or ABCD where they really only ask you to stay within the source itself rather than going beyond it and doing that lateral reading. Um, on this guide, we have a fact checking page um, and I have different resources here. I have some newspaper resources. Um, I have a box, I'm building more into this. Um, I have a box about candidates and elections. There's a lot more there. Some fact checking sites, some that you may have used or may know about like Snopes or PolitiFact or factcheck.org. Um, there's also really nice, um, the Duke Reporters Lab fact checking is, is nice because it looks at different fact checking um, uh, sites, I guess, sites and projects. So if I'm like, oh, this looks like it's in North Carolina, I can look and see um, what they have. And it looks like there is PolitiFact North Carolina and there is the News and Observer Fact Checking Project. So you can look and see if there's anything local to you 
um, that might hit on fact checking resources for local news that might not get covered from something national like Snopes or um, factcheck.org. Um, and then I have some information on here about finding healthcare statistics and other kinds of statistics as well. Uh, if you have resources that you think I should add to this guide, please let me know. Um, and then on the learn more tab, I have um, a link again to that web literacy for student fact checkers book by Mike Caulfield. Um, but I also have three different self paced online learning courses. So if this is something you're into and you want to learn more about um, this first one check please online starter course is about two and a half to three hours created also by Mike Caulfield. Um, the International Fact Checking Network at the Pointer Institute um, has a, a hands on fact checking course that's about an hour and a half to do. And then Google News Initiative actually has some really cool modules about verifying information as well. So if it's something that you want to explore more, there's so much good stuff out there. All right, I'll come back to my slides. Um, and what I want us to do now is we are going to watch a political ad. Um, I am going to give you the uh, disclaimer that I am not showing this political ad because I have any particular feelings about this candidate. I just think it is a good thing for us to practice fact checking with. And if you're like me, um, it is not about Trump. It is, uh, it, is about, it is about Tom Tillis. How about that? I'll give you that warning. But it's only 30 seconds long. Um, and it is... Um, something that I uh, have seen on, seen a lot on local TV. So, here we go. My name is Vivian Connell. I've been in the classroom for 20 years. I always want my students to start with facts. And the fact is that Tom Tillis is terrible for education in North Carolina. He cut $500 million from our budget. His cuts go so deep, there are no longer enough textbooks to go around. Tillis even voted to increase class sizes so kids don't get the attention they need. Fact is, Tom Tillis hurts North Carolina students. The NEA Advocacy Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. My name is... Oh, I did not mean to replay it. Okay, so there's our, our Tom Tillis. Our uh, Tom Tillis is terrible for education in North Carolina. Um, this, like I said, this is one I have seen um, a number of times on TV. Um, and so uh, I want us to use this one as kind of an example. So first, what we're going to do, we're going to use that S in SIFT. Um, and uh, I'm glad for uh, Catherine's um, comments in the chat about whether or not this, the ad I was going to show might be something she needed happy food for. Um, when we see at this point, we're in such a, I think we're in such a polarized uh, political climate that almost any politically related news or ads or social media posts or anything like that is going to trigger an emotional response. Um, so the first thing to do is to just sort of like check your emotional response. I think, you know, feel it and then try to put it aside. So my recommendation, and this is optional, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to do it. Um, my recommendation is to close your eyes and take a couple of deep breaths. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take two deep breaths. And I'm not trying to deny my emotional response, but I am trying to move past it for fact checking purposes. Um, there's a lot of interesting research out there about uh, why we share things that we find online. And usually it's because we have some kind of strong emotional response to it, whether it's rage or joy or, you know, excitement, you know, there, there is research out there that shows that we are more likely to just quickly retweet or share something um, if we have a quick uh, or if we have a, an immediate emotional response to it. So we've done that, stop the S, and now we're going to investigate together. Um, so I'm going to ask you all to participate in this um, and to use the chat. So um, I can tell you who's behind this ad. I won't make you watch it again. 
but it is the, uh, let me make sure I have their information correct, but they say it at the end, but it's one of those sort of like small print things where they say it really fast. Um, I think it's the National Education Association Advocacy Network or something like that. Actually, I guess I will maybe have to go to the end, but here, you don't have to watch the whole thing. The National Education Association Advocacy Fund. So that's who is uh, the organization behind this. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do some of that lateral reading that I was talking about. So you're going to go try and find out what you can about the National Education Association Advocacy Fund or the NEA Advocacy Fund um, to see what you can find out there. And if you find something that looks interesting that helps you learn more about this organization, um, you, can, you can paste links or, or whatever you find in the chat. So I'm going to give you about two minutes to do this and then we will um, talk through what you found. All right, so um, if you have found anything interesting in your searching that you think that we could look at as a group, if you'll paste links into the chat. Okay, Anna found a site she'd never heard of called Ballotpedia. Ballotpedia, I, first, I am aware of this site, but I always want to call it Ballotopedia, which is wrong. Um, and Sean found some stuff from the FEC. So when I Googled, let me just, let's just do this together. Oops. When I Googled NEA Advocacy Fund, um, I found Ballotpedia was my third one. Um, I found stuff from Open Secrets first. Open Secrets is um, <coughs> a uh, resource that shows you spending by, uh, political actors, so including politicians themselves and also super PACs and PACs. So this is a super PAC, um, the NEA the Advocacy Fund, um, and so you can actually find information here about their um, like campaign finance, about what they've raised, what they've spent, you know, how that has all shaken up. The other thing that y'all mentioned was Ballotpedia. I like Ballotpedia. Um, it is part, uh, it's connected to the uh, Encyclopedia of American Politics, um, and it's good about giving definitions and background. Um, so we've got uh, their super PAC launched by the NEA, um, which is the nation's largest teachers union in 2010. They're in Washington, D.C. Their background is, uh, let's see, they're also affiliated with the NEA Fund for Children in Public Ed, which is a, PAC, a federal PAC organization makes independent expenditures to influence elections based on candidates stated education policies. So we could see why they would get, you know, involved um, in this election if they, you know, are wanting to um, show voters or show potential voters uh, the issues that they feel like uh, Tom Tillis has had as someone with education. Um, and they actually, it looks like they talked to, okay, yeah, the biggest expenditures in the 2016 election um, you can see what they have spent. So they spent um, 
a lot of money for, I mean, it's a lot of money to me, I guess compared to other PACs, it's probably not as much. Um, money for uh, Hillary Clinton and for Katie McGinty, Denise Juno and Bruce Braley, and then uh, money against a number of people, including Tom Tillis. Um, so we can see that they do have sort of a history of uh, working against Tom Tillis. Um, so in that way, this uh, ad is really consistent with what their position has been. And it's interesting when you go through, because um, you can sort of see the history. And this is an organization that's only existed since 2010. Um, so we can actually look, get a decent um, look at their whole spending and fundraising history. Although it does like basically stop at 2016. Um, I assume that there will be a time, um, probably pretty soon, um, when they start to update this for the 2020 election cycle. So this is definitely a fact-checking resource um, that I recommend. I'm going to look and see what uh, this, what, what Sean found. So PACs and super PACs are supposed to um, report and file documents with the FEC. Um, so it's, this is all public record from um, the uh, Federal Election Commission. So we should be able to find like full information. It's often like really detailed legalese kind of stuff. Let's see, something they submitted last month. Um, so yeah, it's usually these kind of like tax forms kind of things that they have to submit um, showing uh, what they've received, how they've spent their money and that kind of thing. Um, so it's nice that you can find that, um, especially if it's something that you are comfortable uh, like reading through and understanding. And then Sean also put in this link, um, Education Votes, uh, which is uh, related to the National Education Association, which is what that PAC, who formed that PAC initially. Um, and it looks like this is where they put lots of information about specific candidates, specific issues um, from an education or an educator's perspective. So that looks like a good resource as well. All right, so I think we know enough about our organization here to understand um, that they have a history of uh, being against Tom Tillis and his education related policies in the Senate. Um, so we're going to look at the F now in SIFT and this is find trusted coverage. So I'm going to ask y'all to go uh, beyond. So there, okay, we're going to look generally out there. It doesn't have to connect directly to this ad. I want to see if you can find coverage from a news source that you like or any other kind of source. It doesn't have to be news. It could be from the, you know, federal government um, that gives more evidence about Tom Tillis and his history with education funding because it's really education funding that this campaign ad is about. So I want to see what you can find in terms of other other coverage, finding trusted coverage that's out there um, that would talk about this larger issue that's at stake here. And once again, I'm gonna give you a few minutes with this and I will ask you to share what you find in the chat. And then we will move on to the T for this example and then I will let you, uh, I will put you in groups and we'll do some fun work on our own.
All right, we've got one share in the chat so far. So if you find any um, information that you want to share, please feel free to do so. All right, I'm gonna start looking through what people are sharing. So, um, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull in the most recent one that um, that Sean um, shared, which is from tillis.senate.gov, um, which has his um, uh, track record of bipartisan results related to education. Now, uh, Sean points out this is from this is this is information that Tom Tillis controls, right? Is his senatorial uh, website through the federal government, um, so he can make claims on here um, that we may not be able to fully fact check because they are sort of generalized claims. Um, but if we were to look only at this, um, we might say like I don't know. Sounds like he's done a pretty great job, um, which is completely um, the opposite of what our campaign ad indicated. Um, so this would definitely be one of those things. Um, this is a great example of when lateral reading would be really important, right? Because if we only took it at its word here, we might not find other sort of perspectives about this. Um, okay, Christine submitted this from NC Policy Watch. Um, Betsy DeVos family boosts Tillis's 2020 campaign. Ah, very interesting. Um, so looking at the uh, relationship between Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, and Tom Tillis. Um, and that, oh yeah, this is a very interesting one. I haven't read this article, um, but it looks like it shows some of the ways that Tillis has supported Betsy DeVos, who is a pretty controversial figure um, in general and is someone I would say is probably not, uh, his, his controversial among educators. Um, so we see here some information about that and that gives us sort of a, that gives us a different kind of um, insight into Tom Tillis and his um, sort of history with education um, in the United States. And this is from NC Policy Watch, um, which they call the Progressive Pulse. Um, and that is definitely uh, a source that I think is, I, I think we can safely say that this source does have a political uh, have a political bias that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong right we would be able to do our own sort of checking to see if this is consistent with other things um, they usually do a pretty nice job of um, citing their sources informally you know they give links out to um, where they're getting their information from um, so while i would say we we could probably tell by the fact that they call themselves the progressive pulse that they have a progressive um, political agenda. But having an agenda or having bias doesn't mean that your information is not accurate. It just usually means we want to make sure we're checking it. Uh, let's look at factcheck.org. Tillis, education budget backer or hacker. And this is an older piece. It's from 2014. Um, and we watched that ad. You know, it was coming across the screen pretty fast. But most of the um, sources they cited in the ad itself, and again, this is a common convention in political campaign ads when we are looking at a third party organization or a PAC creating it, um, they typically will give you these citations to newspaper articles or to other sources. So most of the newspaper articles they were citing were from 2013, 2014. So that's right on track with what this, um, this featured post, this fact check post about Tom Tillis um, is focusing on. So um, Tillis education budget backer or hacker, um, a North Carolina public. So this must be like a, I guess this is an older ad. I have seen it recently, but I guess it's been around for a while because it sounds like the one we just watched. Public school teacher says she tells her students to start with facts um, and then she talks about education cuts. Um, in this ad, the teacher says, Tillis, while State House Speaker, cut $500 million from our budget. That's not true. We found total state education spending increased by more than $700 million, but it hasn't kept pace with enrollment. 
Um, in, if one factors in enrollment, education funding is $368 million less than what a state funding formula says it should be, but not $500 million. Um, so it talks a little bit about where they got that $500 million number from um, and sort of analyzes and investigates that. Factcheck.org does a really nice job. They're part of the Annenberg Public Policy Center um, from USC, and they have a really um, they do really robust fact checking and it's nice that they again provide links out um, to what you can find but they're going to go more in depth because the answer especially when we talk about political ads is usually not it's correct or it's incorrect but more like um, it gets this part right but maybe not this part because obviously a political ad again has a very specific agenda and then i'm going to pull up Catherine's link from the ncdp nc democratic party i don't want tickets. Um, and we have another uh, Senator Tillis education legacy, a system where many students are left behind. Um, so we can read through this one to see how we can, what we can find out again about his sort of history with education. Uh, and we can use that to move to do even more lateral reading to try to find other sources. Um, that might help us um, figure out what's what. So that was awesome. Um, awesome uh, finding, awesome, I was gonna say, awesome, you're awesome in the F of SIFT, there we go. Um, and now we're gonna do the T, trace a claim. Um, so that, and actually y'all are like way ahead of me, so good job, um, particularly Anna, good job finding that one. Um, the first claim made in that, which is what that factcheck.org source was looking at, is that he cut $500 million from our schools. Um, and we can try to verify that in different ways. Way to go, Anna. Yes, very cool, very cool. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to ask you all to do is at that point in the ad when she's making that statement, um, she lists, or well, she doesn't, the NEA Advocacy um, Fund lists uh, articles from the Charlotte Observer and the Associated Press from 7-23-2013. So I wanted to see if we can actually find those articles still. So I'll give you a minute to look around and see if you could find what they're probably talking about. It didn't give titles of articles, just the date and the publication so that we can see where that information originally came from. All right, so was anyone able to find either of these things that were um, specifically listed in the video? Yeah, Anna says she's struggling. I am too. I'm not finding um, those things. 
uh, the specific articles. And it may be, again, just because this is an older ad using older stuff. Um, but I'm finding lots in the Charlotte Observer about Tom Tillis. He is covered in there quite frequently, um, specifically as there are, there are things related to education here as well. Um, but this would definitely be a, a case where, um, you know, we could use that source that Anna found for us in the last bit where she used that factcheck.org source, um, which specifically goes into this ad and does some tracing um, of claims. But uh, that, that's probably going to be our most helpful um, resource. Yeah, I think you're right, Sean. I think you'd have to go to the Charlotte Observer archives um, and start looking for that. Um, they, have, they have a lot of their stuff online, but um, it may have a different title um, or it may not mention that specific $500 million number. Um, so we would probably have to uh, go into, we probably have to do a little more digging if we really wanted to um, find it. So that's just one of the claims and looking at how we might try to trace it. Um, the sources that I'm gonna give y'all in a minute when you're in your groups are like brand new, um, very recent stuff. So hopefully it'll be a little bit easier and you won't run into that you know, trying to find old, older stuff. Um, but what we're gonna do in your groups, we're gonna use the breakout rooms feature. It's gonna be exciting, I'm excited. Um, and because of the number of people that we have, um, I'm going to put you all into two groups. Um, and before we do that, I'm going to paste a link into the chat if I can find the right. Yes. Okay. And what this link will do, it will take you to a Google Drive folder. Um, and I'm going to click on it here um, just so that you can see what it will look like. And I had it prepared so that we could do up to four groups, but we're going to do two. So we'll just use group one and group two. I'm going to put you in the breakout rooms. If you haven't used Zoom breakout rooms, they're fun. Um, and at the top left of the screen, you'll see something that will say like breakout room one or breakout room two. Um, and that will be the number that corresponds with the group document that you're going to look at. So for group one, they're going to take a look at a tweet. We're moving beyond political ads. Don't worry, you have, don't have to watch a political ad. Um, we're going to look, they're going to look at a tweet and try to go through this. And this is an editable document. Um, so y'all, as you're thinking through um, answering these questions and going through these moves, um, you can add things, add links, add evidence, add that kind of stuff, um, working together in your group. Um, so this group will look at a tweet and then group two is going to look at an article um, from CNBC about a mask related study. Um, and um, this, with this one, because it is lengthy, it's a longer article and we don't have a huge amount of time, I would encourage um, y'all to just focus on maybe fact checking a few things um, just to see where you go. But this is very like low key. There's no right or wrong answers with any of this. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance to practice this. Um, so, Everybody, are y'all feeling okay about what I'm gonna ask you to do here? Go into these rooms, chat with each other vocally, and also work together in documents. Okay, Anna says yes. And, and Juanita says yes. That's like 25% of people who are in this room, so I think that's a good sign. So actually first, so that I remember this for myself, I'm gonna pause our recording um, because we don't really need to record breakout rooms. It won't actually record what's going on in there. So it would just be recording me sitting in the main room. Um, but I will pause that recording. The recording started again. Okay, so as we're coming back from our breakout rooms, recording is restarted. Um, and we don't have a ton of time left, but I would love to hear from each group. Um, so, um, can someone from breakout room one, so that was Anna, Christine, and Catherine. Oh, that was an all tech services group, huh? Um, can one of y'all uh, kind of sh share anything and you can unmute yourself if you want to do that. Um, what, uh, what your experience was like trying to fact check the information in that tweet? Yeah, uh, it's hard because of course it has a bias, like it's him talking about himself as he, so this was a tweet from Cal Cunningham um, talking about uh, healthcare and what his uh, priorities are with that. And he's obviously he's running for Senate, so he has an agenda. 
Um, I'm, I, we looked at some of the some of the things that we had looked at, we talked about earlier in, in the session, Ballotpedia and some other things. And Catherine was searching for, so there's a quote in it that says there's still more than 1 million people in our state without any coverage at all. And Catherine was looking for the source of that information. And we kind of struggled to find that. I think this was like, we can read about him on Ballotpedia, but like, it's kind of hard to fact check like what he actually believes or like what he will do in the future. Um, so this was an interesting one to think about. Yeah, this is definitely one of those. Um, it's part of why I wanted to say that we can't use SIFT to predict things. Unfortunately, it would make things a lot easier if we could. Um, but like, you're exactly right. We can't say that we like you can't fact check someone's feelings or beliefs or what they say they will do. So in a case like that, the main thing that you can try to find right is the like the number really the specific claim made about people being without um, is it without insurance? Now I I have closed it down, but it was yeah it says that without any coverage at all. But where is this coming from? We're not sure. Yeah. But it is definitely, this is the kind of thing, so for, for me as someone who um, relies a lot on my health care, my health coverage, um, this might be the kind of thing that I would quickly be like, oh, I'm going to share this because this is serious. We have, um, you know, we have 1 million people in our state who need health care coverage or need health coverage. Um, so it's the kind of thing that would be really easy to retweet and uh, like and maybe even share with other people. And it's also the kind of thing that might stick in your head later when you're, you know, I don't know, having an argument um, about this with someone or a discussion, a, a reasonable discussion. Um, okay, so it gives, it tries to give a link to a page, but that doesn't actually work. Yeah, so this is, this is a, uh, I, I chose something from Cal Cunningham since he's since we've been you know hating on Tom Hill, Tom Tillis because of that um, ad that I showed as an example. So I wanted to show something from you know his direct opponent, um, and it's something like y'all said. It's it's tough. Fact checking is not an easy process. All right, anybody from Group Two want to talk about the uh, article that y'all looked at? And this is something. Um, this is the kind of thing I talk to students about a lot. I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to do a share screen here real quick. Um, but anybody from group two want to talk about y'all's experience there? Well, I guess for, can you all hear me? Yes. So we, um, we thought the article was, was, I say good. Uh, we like that it had links to the actual study because we clicked off those study links so that we could read the actual study, which helped to provide at least our own ability to interpret the article so that even if we couldn't say 100% fact check the other material, we could read the study ourselves and create our own conclusion as to whether the study was legit enough to determine that antisocial or narcissistic behavior is correlated directly with not wearing a mask or supporting health initiatives. So um, that was one thing we definitely, and we all, but we also interpreted knowing the article, you know, headline seemed a little misleading and that it was more eye-catching clickbait-esque than necessarily, you know, totally direct, but we just glad they had the links to it so we could do our own follow-up research. Because once the study's there, then we know methodologies, limitations, how many numbers were actually interviewed, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And one of the reasons that this stuck out to me when I was just looking for um, news sources for this activity is this, like you said, this headline um, is not like, it's not, it doesn't exactly reflect what we see in the article, but it's like, it's a nice sound bite that you might, that you might kind of in, in your mind get stuck on and say like, Ugh, I knew it, these people who don't wear masks are sociopaths or have antisocial personality disorder. Um, because again, it kind of maybe confirms your experience, confirms what you believe, makes you feel a certain kind of way. Um, but this is something, like I mentioned, I talk to students about this kind of thing all of the time. 
um, which is that a lot of times we have to rely on news sources to report scientific information to us. Like we could actually get this study because um, we have access, that was me right here, access through your institution. Um, so we have access to this um, through our subscriptions as part of UNCG. Um, but people who don't have that kind of affiliation are counting on these like news reports to be the things that help us understand what's going on. There's a great John Oliver clip about this that um, I can um, link when I put the slides up on our uh, ULVLC uh, page on ULVLC LibGuide, but he talks about this. So, so the issue here is sort of misreporting a little bit and Melody in the chat and, and Juanita also have mentioned um, you know, the, the headline, you know, really pushes that sociopathic thing because that's, you know, kind of, it's an interesting term that's going to catch people's attention, but the uh, actual study is not like super useful. And Juanita just mentions, or it's not, not super, I didn't mean not super useful, the actual study is um, kind of reports something different. And Juanita mentions the article mentions it typically affects 1% of the population and cites studies conducted outside of the US, which can change the context. Very much so. So what, what we see here is very common in the news, um, which is we're making sort of a sweeping broad statement um, that we've extrapolated from probably a pretty small study. Um, and in this case, a study in Brazil, um, 1,578 Brazilian adults. And um, so, but it's not going to be that interesting to share online if they actually used a headline that was like 1500 Brazilian adults showed this. They want it to be something that's broader, that's more interesting to people. All right, y'all, we are right at one. Thank you all so much for doing this. This was, I really enjoyed this and I am very grateful to y'all for participating on a Friday at lunchtime. Um, and I'm going to put the little assessment form link in here. Um, and I will put uh, this um, recording and the slides that have links to all my resources on um, the research guide for the ULVLC, the LibGuide. Um, but this is something like I have done SIFT workshops several in the last couple of weeks for classes. I have one coming up next week. Um, so this is something um, that I would do with a class and actually I'm going to keep these examples because I think they're pretty awesome um, and what y'all did with them was pretty great. So thank you all for uh, guinea pigging for me as well. Um, and I hope everyone has a great Friday and a great weekend. And um, if you're able to come to the ULVLC virtual coffee hour next week, it's on Wednesday afternoon. It's going to be fun. We're going to use the breakout rooms again if we have enough people so we can just like have smaller group chats. All right, I'm going to stop. Uh, the recording and I'm going to end the session. Thank you all so much.